Well, good morning, Grace Bible Fellowship. How are you? Wonderful. Excellent. If you guys will find your seats, we'll get started. So we're starting a new book today. We're going to be in 1 Peter. 1 Peter, an interesting book uh, written by Peter, the, the apostle that we know the most about from the scriptures. Uh, the New Testament, that more is written about Peter uh, than any of the other disciples. And so we have a good background understanding who he is. But as we look at the letter that he writes, it is a deep theological work. And it is woven together, obviously written by the Holy Spirit, but penned by uh, Peter and Silvanus, uh, who we are introduced to later on in the letter. It's, uh, it's just an incredible bit of information as we're about to dive in. So um, that's where we're going. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to open your word that it's been preserved down through the ages for us, that the experiences, the wisdom and the knowledge of those who have gone before us, and of Peter, who has seen the risen Christ, who has had a unique experience. Lord, we have much to learn from him and from your Holy Spirit. We pray that you might teach us, that you might help us, and be with me, Lord, as I look it over and bring out the various points, that I might say those things that you'd have me say, and that it might resonate with the hearts that you have prepared. Lord, we owe you our lives. We owe you everything, and I pray that you might use this time to make us more like you, and we so need it. pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, today's highlight scripture is the, is the title in the beginning, Peter. Like, that says a whole lot right there, just Peter, because we know Peter. We know Peter wasn't always Peter, right? Peter had a name change. In fact, you'll notice throughout the scriptures, God the Father in the Old Testament and also Jesus Christ in the New Testament changed people's names, right? If you remember, his name was Simon, that's how it's pronounced, or Simon, which means hearing. Of course, he had a little trouble when he was sleeping, and he had a little trouble listening, but his name is hearing. And of course, Jesus changed his name to Cephas, uh, or Kepha, if you want to pronounce it properly, or Peter in the Greek. And Peter means rock. And so he took him from listening to rock, and he was known as Rocky to all the disciples, <laughs> which I'm sure caused some friction because they didn't get new names, but Peter got a new name. And it's interesting, he says, you are Simon, son of Jonah, but you shall be called Peter. It's interesting. He didn't say from now on you'll be called Peter. Which tells me it took some time before he became a rock. Because he said, you shall be called Peter. And it's interesting, just Peter's introduction. He says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, you know the, the writings of Paul. He's got 13 letters and he writes to seven churches and then some others. He always introduces himself as an apostle by the will of God. And he introduces himself as a servant, a doulos of the Lord. He, he always refers to himself in these other terms, other than just giving it straight. Like Peter just says, Peter, an apostle. Yeah, I'm that guy. You know, the one you heard about, you know, ur, 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 you know, that guy. Yeah, that's, that's me. He doesn't need to give you an introduction. He doesn't need to tell you anything else other than, uh, yeah, I'm Peter. Uh, the name stuck and, and I'm, I'm sticking with it and that's who I am. And of course, we know this Peter, right? This is the Peter who said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And, and Jesus looked at him and said, well, flesh and blood, you know, good on you, Peter, if he was Australian. You, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my father who's in heaven. And then promptly after that, Jesus told him, I'm going to go to the cross and die. And he goes, no, far be it from you, Lord, may it never be. And he said, get behind me, Satan. Now, this is Peter. This is the Peter writing this letter. This is the Peter who was in a boat, in his own fishing boat, and saw Jesus walking on water, and everybody was scared to death. And Peter said, Lord, if that's you, ask me to come out of the boat and walk to you, and I will. And he said, come. And Peter gets out of the boat. And walks on water for a little while. 
and then he promptly sinks and Jesus has to pull him up and he says, why did you doubt? You were doing well. It's that Peter. It's the Peter who said, Lord, I would never, ever leave you. And everyone else might forsake you, but I will never do that. And he says, well, in truth, Peter, you're going to deny me three times by the time that the rooster crows twice in the morning. And it says that Peter followed Jesus at a distance as they took him in. He followed at a distance. It's never good to follow Jesus at a distance. It's always an indicator there's something wrong. And he was allowed into the gate, into the place where he was being tried. And the third time that he rejected knowing Jesus Christ, it says that in the book of Mark, we just got through that Jesus looked at him. And it says that he left and he wept bitterly. So that's how we get Peter left with the Lord until the resurrection, when Jesus is risen. And he tells Mary, he says, go back and tell my disciples and Peter. He gets special billing. And of course, there's the instance where the Lord goes to Peter and shows himself risen. And he does it privately. It's not even written, it's mentioned, but it's not given in detail or put on a timeline. It's an interesting relationship that Peter has with Jesus. And then in John chapter 21, we see Jesus coming. He's on the shore. Peter went back to fishing because he's not going to fish for men anymore. And Jesus cries out, children, do you have any food? Meaning, have you caught any fish? <coughs> and they were fishing all night. You know, Peter's all stripped down to barely nothing and working hard to make this thing happen because he's in charge because wherever he goes, he's in charge. And he says, no, he says, well, throw the net on the right side of the boat and you'll have more than enough. And John in the boat says, it's the Lord. And they throw the net on the other side of the boat and they have so many fish that they can't land it. They can't put it in the boat. They can't get it in. And so Peter puts on his clothes and jumps in the water. <laughs> and he swims to Jesus because he's done fishing. Even with all those fish, he's done. Because the Lord is there. Jesus takes him for a walk and he says, Peter, do you love me more than these? Commentators talk about whether it's the fish or whether it's the other disciples. Do you love me more than these? He says, Lord, you know I love you like a brother. He says, I want to feed my sheep. And Jesus asks three times, do you love me? Do you love me unconditionally, Peter? Are you ready to do anything I ask you to do? And he says, I love you like a brother. That's about as far as I can get. Peter, the boaster, doesn't boast anymore. He now just says, I, I know what real love is, and you have it, and I just don't. And so we see Peter left in this sort of humble way. And then the second chapter of Acts, he's there praying with 120 disciples in the upper room. And this mighty rushing wind sound is going on. And there are tongues of fire on the heads of all the disciples. And they're all speaking in other languages. And there are people from all these different places that are walking by from Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia, and we're given the names of all these places, and guess where they're found again? Here in 1 Peter. Peter is writing to all of these places where all of those people that accepted Christ went. And it's a circular letter. It's not written as a letter of correction. It's not written for any other reason other than to inform, equip, and encourage so it's a very different letter than, for instance, 1 Corinthians, which is highly corrective. And so you have to kind of read it with a certain ear. But Peter, that's a lot for one word. Peter, who are the people? To the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. These are all the places where the people who had accepted Jesus Christ and stuck around and they went. All of these places are found in Turkey. Anybody know where Turkey is? Yeah, you better. 
Here you go, if you're looking for it. Um, here's uh, Macedonian, Thrace, and Illyricum. So it's, it's on the Mediterranean or the Aegean Sea. So all of those places are found right in there, and that's who he's writing to. All of these Christians that undoubtedly have, from the second chapter of Acts on, gone out. Now, Peter is probably about 30 years old. I'm sorry. It's 30 years since, because it's 64 A.D., so it's roughly 30 years from the time that we see Peter following Jesus and the death of Jesus on the cross. So he's an older man now. He's not a kid. And he's writing this letter as a mature man of God who's walked with the Lord all of this time. In fact, if you read through the book of Acts, the first 10 chapters basically covers Peter's ministry until he gets crucified. He gets crucified upside down because they, he won't let them crucify him upright like Jesus because he's not worthy to die like the Lord. And so they hang him upside down, which is even more excruciating. But he chose that rather than to cast a shadow on what Jesus did and try to compete. And so Peter... The purpose of his letter, and you're going to see as we read through, and I'll point it out, is he's trying to give hope to these Christians. Because in 64 AD, Rome burns. Rome burns under Nero. You may have heard of him. He's kind of a crazy guy. And he set the fire in Rome and blamed the Christians. It says that he fiddled while Rome burned, but that isn't true. That's just a, an old wives' tale. Or... Why do they call it an old wives' tale? I don't know. But it's just a rumor. He was in the business of building things, and he wanted to get rid of a bunch of buildings that were already built because Rome is fully furnished and fully built. And so he actually burned a whole section. He tried to cast people out. And what he did is he blamed the Christians. And so what they did is they cast all the Jews out and all the Christians out of Rome. And then we have Priscilla and Aquila who are part of that number and they end up hooking up with the Apostle Paul making tents and coming as Christians and entering the ministry with Paul. So it's an interesting thing. So the, the book is written somewhere between 64 and 68 AD and he's an older man. And he's trying to give hope to them because they're under intense persecution. There are Christians that are being killed that, and they're certainly, uh, they're, they've gone underground. There are churches in homes which, you know, if things get worse in this world, that's what we'll do. I'll give you my address. That's where we'll be, uh, unless we find a bigger place. He's trying to give hope to people being persecuted. He's going to speak about conduct, about how those who are saved, those who have been regenerated, born from above, filled with the Spirit of God, how do we live? And, you know, there are a lot of people that when they become Christians, they don't know how to live. How many of you knew exactly how to live when you became a Christian? I didn't know. I still did a bunch of stupid things, and I didn't even know they were stupid. Until I started to read the Word. Until I started getting around other believers. And other believers were telling me, you smell like pot. <laughs> yeah. Like, you still smoke pot? Yeah, it's all right. I don't care. Well, you know, your body's a temple of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, what? I never heard that. Where'd you get that? Let me show you. Oh, my goodness. I guess I shouldn't be doing that. I was doing all kinds of things that I shouldn't have been doing. And I didn't know until a brother put his finger in my face and said, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> Which is why it's nice to stay in fellowship, right? Because you got instant accountability. You got people up close to you and they can tell you, hey cut that out. You're not living right. So he's going to talk about conduct. How do we live since we are born again and saved? Suffering. How to endure suffering and how to look at suffering from God's point of view and the purpose of it. He's going to tell them about submission. Submission to wives to husbands, husbands to the Lord, to the government. He's got submission all throughout and we're going to talk about that when we get to it. And he's also going to talk about being separate, that we are not like the world, that we should not look like, smell like, talk like, act like the rest of the world, because we don't belong here. This is just a temporary stay. Amen? Yes. So we know who it's to. 
Peter's purpose in doing this is probably like every other apostle and those who are gifted in here. In Ephesians 4, 11 to 13, it says, and he himself, being God, gave some to be apostles, of which Paul is one, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and teachers. And why did God gift these people to the church? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry. By the way, my job is to equip you to do ministry. And you thought I was the minister. Oh no, I'm just the supply guy. I'm here to supply you so you can do the work of the ministry. I like that scripture. <laughs> for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Until we all come to the unity of the faith, but we've got a long way to go, and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man. In other words, we would all be one as though we had one voice, one mind, one doctrine, one heart for the Lord and for his word. And we would be perfect. It doesn't mean perfect like you think it means. It means mature, fully mature. It doesn't mean that, you know, like if you're a perfectionist, there's nothing that's ever good enough. How many of you are perfectionists? Perfect. She can't be a perfectionist. She married you. <laughs> That's okay, because my wife has a bit of perfectionism in her, and she married me. So um, apparently there's a lot of work yet to be done on me, and every woman marries a man thinking they're going to change him anyway. So till we all come to the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That means that I will never, ever be done. I will never retire. I will never be over with my job because my job and my calling and my gifting will always be needed because you guys don't all look like Jesus. Neither do I, which means... No retirement for Pastor Dave. <laughs> I wouldn't want to. So Peter's purpose is to do this. He's going to equip them, which is giving people machinery, giving people tools, giving people weapons, giving people knowledge, wisdom, experience, so that they can do the works of the ministry. So that's his point. That's what he's doing. Verse 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. How many of you are confused? Yeah, we're going to be drinking from a fire hose, okay? This is a lot of information, and it's heavy doctrine right out of the boat. The first word he uses is elect. <clears throat> you know what that means? <clears throat> The Bible teaches, not just here, but in many places, God picks you. Let me ask you, why did he pick you? You better have a Bible verse for me. I'll give you one. Secret things belong to God. Why did he pick you? I can tell you, it says here, you're elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father. That God chooses you according to his foreknowledge. Do you guys understand that? It doesn't mean he picked you because he goes, oh, he's going to turn out just great. <laughs> That's not what it means. It doesn't mean that, oh, I can clean him up easy. It doesn't mean any of that. He picks with foreknowledge. He already knows everything that's going to happen. Now, any of you can explain it to me. I'd really love to hear it because I've read lots of stuff on it and I haven't figured it out yet because I don't have the mind of God. And unless you have the mind of God, well, then you could take his job, but nobody could take his job. How does God have foreknowledge of things? How can Jesus be the lamb that was slain before the foundations of the world? He wasn't even born yet. There wasn't even a world yet. 
But you know what? A God without time who is not imprisoned on a timeline like you and I can do all these things that you and I can't even understand. I love the fact that God picked me. And I have no idea why. The only thing I can reason out is I was so broken and so twisted and so messed up that he said, yeah, there ain't nobody going to believe that's of him. <laughs> and I was just dirty and low enough that God said, I'm going to make him a trophy of my grace. Why did God choose you? I don't know. But I like that a whole lot better than the alternative, which is I chose him. Because if I chose him, then I could also unchoose him. If it was up to me, I would never have become a Christian. God made it overwhelmingly clear to me that he was real and he loved me. And I, I ran. I ran hard in the opposite direction. And yet God chooses us with foreknowledge. Understanding everything that's going to happen. So there's nothing in your life that's going to be surprising to God. He already knows it's going to happen. So if your car doesn't start when you go outside, don't be surprised. Because the Lord isn't. And he's already got a plan on the other side of it. You see how that works out? God's sovereignty and his election with foreknowledge is something that I rest in. It's not something I'm going to argue about or try to even figure out but I'm going to rest in it because he picked me, which means he's in charge. Now, well, what do you do with free will, pastor? Well, I try to serve him with it. What do you do with free will? Can I say something stupid? Of course I can. You know I do. Can I do something stupid? You know I can. Do you, am I tempted of the devil? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, did God put that temptation in my life? Absolutely not. God tempts no man. He's not tempted by evil. Neither does he tempt anyone with evil. But each one is drawn away and they're enticed of their own desire. You see, I can't blame God for my mistakes. I can't say, well, God's sovereign. I guess he wanted me to commit adultery. <laughs> what I can say is God has made me free so I can choose to do what's right now. Amen? Amen. And before that, I was a slave to sin. So what are you doing with your freedom, boys and girls? We have freedom. We can reach out and tell people about Jesus and, and not worry in fear about what they're going to do or whether their feelings are hurt or whether you're woke enough. Just <laughs> tell people about Jesus and love. And all the people that say we're so open-minded, we want to include everybody uh, except you. Show love. Show love. Let people know what it looks like for somebody to belong to the Savior. Show them by your behavior. It's better than anything you can say. Be who Jesus calls us to be. You have the freedom. You have the power to be able to do it. Jesus gave it to us. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification. That's a setting apart, a putting aside a special of the spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Sprinkling of blood. This is a slaughterhouse religion. God's foreknowledge. Sanctification is him cleaning us up and setting us aside for a special, special purpose. Sprinkling of blood. Any of you covered in blood? Sprinkled with blood? Well, if you go to the Old Testament, you go to Deuteronomy. There's some rather interesting things back there. There's a covenant that God makes with the people. And half, half of the sacrifice gets poured into a bowl and the other half gets sprinkled on the people as evidence that they made a covenant. It's, it's a little sloppier than a signature. You know, we, we work with signatures these days. But that's the sprinkling of blood of Jesus Christ. What does that even mean? God saved you and me to be like him. You don't have to wonder why Jesus saved you. I can tell you, Jesus saved you to be like him. That's why he saved you. The reason why he picked you, I have no idea. But I know what he picked you for. 
He picked you that you might be sanctified by the Spirit, that you might live in obedience by the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. By your testimony and accepting that, you enter into a covenant by, by the way that God largely keeps. Because he's the one who keeps our salvation, not us. God saved you to be like him. Here's, a, here's another passage just to show some fruit of what happens when you're a Christian. Ephesians 4, 17 to 24 says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their mind, the endless, purposeless process. Having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness. Do you know you can give yourself over to an evil spirit or bad emotions or a lousy attitude? You guys know that? I hope it wasn't this morning. To work all uncleanness with greediness, but you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard of him and you've been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off. What do you do? You put off. Concerning your former conduct, the old man. I'm not talking about your husbands, ladies. I'm talking about your old nature. The old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, the stuff that's already ticking inside of us, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So we're to put off our old man, and we're to put on, which is something we do. You ever put on some clothes that don't fit? I did that this morning. <laughs> Sometimes doing the things that the Lord wants us to do feels like clothing that doesn't quite fit because we got too fat. But what we're to do is put it on, not get rid of it and get new clothing with larger waist size. Put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to his deceitful di desires, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You know what changes the heart? The mind. What, what should we do? We should dress our minds. It's about what you fill your head with. What's between your ears, people. That's why I read the scriptures. That's why I come to church. That's why I study all week. Because I need to format my mind. Just like a computer. Because if I don't, I will... You get the blue screen of death from me. If I don't set my mind. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. You know, our sanctification is a cooperative effort with the spirit of God. You got some things in your life you want to be rid of? Well, the Lord would love to take them away, but you got to open your hand. You got to let go and take off that old man and you have to put on the new man, which means I have to think differently about people, things, events, trials, hardship, blessings, money. I have to think differently about all those things that I naturally feel. Because if I lean on my own understanding, I'm in deep trouble. How about you? Yep. And so I want to be under the submission of what God wants me to do. I want to put on Jesus Christ and be him. I can never be him, but I can look like him and talk like him and think like him. And I can do all those things that he calls me to do. And so can you. And that is a privilege because without Christ, you couldn't. So God saved you to be like him. I just want to show you something of the structure of this. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the father, the sanctification of the spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Who says there isn't a trinity? Do you see the, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit right there in that scripture? Mm -hmm. They all three have a particular job. It's like a, like a labor union. You know, they all have their thing to do. And so I just wanted to show you the structure of that. And now he's going to greet them finally. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. 
So he's, it, it's called a eulogy, by the way, it, it's good words. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. <clears throat> I told you we were drinking from a fire hose here. This is a lot of theology, right? Let's take it apart. Grace and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again. Begotten us again? That's a curious statement. Who's writing this? <coughs> Peter. He had an event where he denied knowing the Lord Jesus Christ and walked away from him. For him to say that, again, I think he's speaking from experience, don't you? And if you have ever had a time <clears throat> when you've walked away from the Lord and been at a distance like Peter was, he is so excited about the hope that is in Christ that he's gotten again. Do you know our God is a God of second chances? And third chances and fourth chances. Because Jesus would be a hypocrite to tell Peter, <clears throat> you know, Peter, you should forgive your brother 70 times 7. And him not do it. And that's the God we serve. He's abundant in mercy, as the scripture says. Mercy, by the way, is him withholding the judgment we, we are due. Grace is him pouring out gifts we don't deserve. So God's grace is him giving what we don't deserve, and his mercy is withholding the things that we do deserve. And he does both. Again, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Do you realize that we don't hope in someone like Muhammad, who's dead? Confucius, who's dead? Any other teacher that you might mention on the face of the earth, all dead. You can go visit their, their tombs. Their bones are in there. You can go see the tomb of Jesus, but it was just rented. That's a living hope. Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you too will be risen. That's the receipt. You see? The cross was Jesus paying for our sins. The receipt was him being resurrected. You got your receipt? This living hope. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead... To an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, and does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. By the way, if you've come to Jesus Christ, if you've given him your life, if you've been born from above, you've been born again, you say, Jesus, I recognize you to be the savior of the world, the son of God, that you're the boss, and now I'm going to let you be the boss of me for the rest of my life. I give you my life. You've just crossed from death to life. And it says in the scripture that the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of your body as a deposit guaranteeing your inheritance. And it makes us completely new. We see things differently. We feel things differently. We, it changes our behavior. It changes everything about us. If you've done that, then you have an inheritance. Have you ever dreamt of getting an inheritance? Dear sir, your great, 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 great aunt and uncle have died and left you billions of dollars. <laughs> None of you fantasize about such things. None of you get those emails. If you just give me your bank information, oh, yes. <laughs> I will send you 83.9, you know. It's a scam. Yeah. An inheritance. I didn't even know, you know, I didn't get, you know, my dad died, it cost me money. <laughs> it's, and that, that's where I come from. So, like, an inheritance, that'd be cool. And then, gee, how would I spend that? By the way, you have an inheritance. 
And I'm so glad it's reserved in heaven for me because I can't make a, a withdrawal until I get there. And it's kept by whom? Who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Do you know that your salvation is not kept by you? God's promise is kept by him. You will let, your, you will let him down a million times on your side. You know who keeps you saved? God does. Because you have a deposit guaranteeing your inheritance. And the inheritance for you is saved by God in heaven. Aren't you glad? Yes. You lose car keys. You can't find your cell phone. <laughs> you don't know where important paperwork is. Aren't you glad you're not holding on to that inheritance? Aren't you glad that you're not the one responsible for keeping yourself saved? I'm, I'm so stinking excited about it. Because... I mess things up all the time. It is a relationship that will not be altered because it depends on the faithfulness of God and not you. Can I get an amen? amen. Somebody else got to be excited about it besides me. You have an inheritance in heaven and it is kept by faith. It is kept by God. In John 10, 28 to 30, Jesus says, and I give them eternal life. Speaking of those who would follow him. And they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. I and the father are one. Jesus says the relationship that you have with him can't be spoiled, at least your salvation part, by you. I feel incredibly privileged. How about you? Well, what if I curse God? What if I give him the middle finger? What if I, what if I rant and rave? And Okay, well, does that change God's love for you? Does that change his commitment to you? And because of that, I don't do stupid things like that. Because it would break my heart. Because a piece of him lives in me. And I can't. I just can't. We're kept by God, people. You've got to be happy about that. Amen. And there's nobody that can take you out of his hand. Uh, you might make a mistake. You might go off road. You might backslide like Peter, go back to an old profession. Instead of fishing for men, you're fishing for fish. And yet Peter's writing this book, isn't he? He's talking about this living hope and again being begotten by the Father. And in this you greatly rejoice. I hope you do. Though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Remember I told you the history of what they're going through. That the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. He says, you guys are suffering now. Remember when Rome burned in 64 AD, the Christians were under heavy persecution. And even in these areas here in Turkey. And, and it was uh, Roman territory at that point. And so they were, they were slashing and burning and taking Christians out. And he says, I know you're going through some suffering. Let me help you with that. Let me tell you why. Let me show you the benefit of it. Because I don't know about you, but nobody that I know that isn't a sadomasochistic weirdo really enjoys suffering. In fact, somebody told me getting old is the process of finding comfort. And I was like, no, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> I went to the gym this week. I just got sick and sick and tired. And then I said, I'm going to the gym. I put it off too long. I am not going to seek comfort because I know comfort will kill me. 
Get a chair <laughs> and a clicker. Uh, I'm done, man. Give me my phone. <laughs> and I will grow to be like Jabba the Hutt. <laughs> you greatly rejoice now, but for a little while you're going to be grieved by various trials. And why are you having trials? Think of the benefit of it. The, the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to be praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Remember the stoning of Stephen. They said, oh, Steve, he said some bad things about Moses. And they put him out in a square and they gave him a chance to speak. That was a big mistake. Because Stephen was a man of faith. He was a deacon in the church. Sounds like he should have been a pastor. But he was a deacon. He was taking care of physical needs in the body. And he began to rehearse the entire Old Testament back to all of these very well-learned men that wanted to kill him. And he said, if you remember, all the way back, and he goes all the way back, and he talks about the people of God and wandering through the wilderness and all of the prophets. And, and then he says, you stiff-necked people, you always resist the Holy Spirit. So after giving them the whole history, which they were like so proud, he said, you always resist the Holy Spirit. Look at Abraham. Hey, that's a nice lady you got on your arm. Who is that? It's uh, my sister. You like her? Don't hurt me. You people always resist the Holy Spirit. He goes through and talks about all of the, the failings of the people of God who were chosen to, to reveal who God is to the world. And they said, oh, and they tore their clothes and they picked up stones and they stoned him to death right there in the square. Right at the feet of a man named Saul of Tarsus. Who ends up being the most prolific writer of the New Testament. He says, for a little while, and yet this trial brings things out of you that shows your faith is real. You know, if somebody put a gun to your head and said, tell me, do you really believe in Jesus Christ? And they cocked the hammer and you knew they were going to shoot you if you said yes. Would you say yes? You remember Columbine? Somebody invaded a school. There was a Christian girl. That very thing happened to her. That is when you will see whether you really believe or not. When you're under pressure. When you don't feel like doing what the Lord tells you to do. When you don't, when it's a matter of life or death. Then you get to see if your faith is real. And that's when you pray for God's grace, right? Because in and of ourselves, we just don't have the strength. But through the spirit of God, we can do all things. And so it's gold and it's interesting because fire refines gold, doesn't it? You cook the gold and it's the heaviest thing, so it goes to the bottom and all the slag, all that nasty impurity, what it does is it comes to the top and they scrape that off. And when they're done taking all those impurities, you have 24 karat gold, 100% gold. And you can tell it's gold when you look at it and you can see your face. And there's no more gook on the top. And that's what happens with us. We go through some difficult times and some heat and some pressure and some difficulty. And when the face of Jesus Christ is seen in us, then we're mature and a perfect man. But I got a long way to go. How about you? And so I anticipate I'm going to have some hard times because those hard times cook off the junk in my life and cause me to lean upon the Lord. And you know what? I had COVID last week. Thank you, Jesus. If it didn't kill me, it's making me rely upon him. And so I'm good. Our faith is tried by fire and purified. And for them, it also produces patience. Did you know that you ever find somebody who's spoiled, who gets everything they want exactly the way they want it? Have you gone shopping? I mean, do you get out with people much? Do you have a job? I mean, oh, what's the matter? Somebody left my pen out on the desk. Oh, wow. Well, let me help you with that. You all right now? You stay? Okay. 
I wonder if anything really hard ever happened to you, what would happen to you? Go to tie your shoelace and it breaks. Oh, my shoelace broke. <laughs> Favorite pair of shoes. You got another pair of shoes? Yes, but I don't like this. Get over it, Buttercup. Come on, it's a shoelace, you know. I talk to myself that way, so, you know. Hard times make soft people. Hard times make soft people. Soft lives make spoiled brats. So the question is, what do you want to be? If you want to be a soft person, somebody that's loving, somebody that's caring, somebody that has compassion on someone else's suffering, you got to suffer. I, who are the people you have compassion on? I have compassion on drug addicts. You know why? Because that's who I was. I have compassion on people with anger problems. You know why? <laughs> I have compassion on people that have issues with lust. You know why? Because I grew up and I saw pornography since I was like nine years old. And I was programmed by the world to view women as objects, period. I'm not the same guy. I'm still married to my first wife. That's good news. It produces patience in us. Reliance upon God and compassion for other people. In James chapter 1, verses 2 to 5, it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. That sounds a little masochistic, doesn't it? Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. In other words, God is not going to leave you a spoiled brat. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Don't pray for the trial to go away. Let the trial have its full effect on you so you become patient. Well, that, I never heard that at prayer meeting. <laughs> prayer meetings where you go and you got, got to get rid of this and this and this and this and this and this. Amen. And then life will be great. You know, there are some things we're supposed to embrace. What do you do when you get COVID? Nothing. You got to embrace that. God's doing a work. God was doing a work in me for a week. And I was, I couldn't wait to go. Let, let's go outside. Let's go somewhere. Let's do something. I don't care if I'm miserable. I can't sit down another minute. You know, that's not a good spirit for a person to have. I started wondering who I was, and I felt like I was a kid playing hooky from school. Yeah, but Carl and Randy and Raul and, I mean, everybody's going to, you know, Johnny, everybody's going to have to pick up the slack for me, and I felt miserable and horrible about that. Lord said, so what are you going to do about that? <laughs> Nothing. Rest and embrace it. I got a break. I got rest. Didn't feel like a rest. Wore me out. Have joy when you fall into various trials. Joy. Not joy that the trial's happening. Yay, my car broke down. No, not, you know, yay, I have a flat tire. Yay, I have joy. No, it's not joy about the trial. It's joy that God is working in you, that which is pleasing to him. We have joy that God is working on you. Listen, if you have no trouble, if you have no difficulty in your life, you start to wonder, am I really a Christian? I got no hardship in my life. God is not growing me up to be tough at all. Maybe I don't know him. I don't know about you, but I start to have things like that. When things are going great, everything's wonderful, and there's no hardship, I wonder, what am I doing wrong? Because if you're going to be, live holy in this life, you're going to suffer persecution. Scripture says so. It's a promise. But have joy when you fall into the trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. It's because you know that God is working it out for your good. And so whatever difficulty it is you have, whether it's a stupid clicker that won't respond, 
or it's my computer that takes 20 minutes to warm up so they can at least log in or whatever the thing is, I could go, ah. Oh. Or I could say, all right, Lord, I'm going to find something else to keep me busy. I got something else to do. And I have found this to be a wonderful thing. My wife, don't get mad at me, ladies. My wife takes longer to get ready to go places than I do. Silence descended upon the room that day. <laughs> and so I find myself waiting for her very typically. See, I can get up, throw on clothes, and go right out the door, not even, not even comb my hair. That's why I cut it short. <laughs> my wife, you know, she, she's got to brush her teeth, and, you know, she, she's got floss, and, you know, she's got things to do, and hair. She's got nice hair. I like the hair. So. And she dresses nice, you know, and it takes, and she picks things out and really considers how to dress them. I have found out what to do while waiting. Do something else. <laughs> Because sitting there waiting is just torture. <laughs> I was waiting for my wife the other day. You know what I did? I looked at my front lawn and I said, I haven't whacked the weeds in forever. And I opened the garage and I got the weed whacker out and I'm whacking the weeds. My wife came out of the car, came out and got in the car. And I didn't know she was in the car. And I'm like, <laughs> keeping busy. And I, I said, oh, I'm sorry, honey. I didn't even know you were in the car. She goes, that's all right. Because you know what she was doing? She was doing something else. She was on her phone, you know. <laughs> and we do this. We like leapfrog over each other. I'm waiting for her, then she's waiting for me, then I'm waiting for her. And it's like, all right, here's the deadline. We're leaving in five minutes. Synchronized watches. I don't really say that, but I, I think it. Have joy in the trial knowing that God is creating in you his character. So when you got hardship... <laughs> or, all right, Lord, you intend this for my good. What do you want me to get out of this? I'm just saying. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18, it says, Therefore we do not lose heart, though outwardly we're wasting away. Can I get an amen? amen. Any of you old outwardly wasting away? And yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles, by the way, your troubles are light and momentary too, are achieving in us, for us, an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, that which is unseen is eternal. It's about, it's about setting our minds and our eyes on eternity, on God's plan and his kingdom, and not what we want. That makes all the difference, doesn't it? When you see your trials as being light and momentary, <laughs> I snap a shoelace. <clears throat> yeah, I knew that was going to happen. Because outwardly, we're wasting away, including my shoes. And yet, inwardly, we should be constantly being rejuvenated and remade on the inside as God informs us and directs us and guides us and encourages us. We focus on what is unseen and God refines us with fire. Too much animation. Verse 10. Of this salvation in which they're rejoicing about, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or by what manner of time the spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand of the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them, it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering to things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things which angels desire to look into. Any of you confused about this passage? One person. I'm talking to you then, sweetheart. Okay. <laughs> the prophets of old, as they were writing, moved along by the Holy Spirit. When they got done writing, they looked at their writings and said, what the heck's that mean? By his stripes will be healed. Do you think Isaiah had any clue what he was writing? 
They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. Do you think David knew what he was writing? Do you think the writers of the scripture had a clear understanding of what God was trying to write down through them? Can you imagine that? You're, you're sitting there writing things out as God's given it to you, and then you go, wow, that's really good. But what does it mean? And it wasn't for them. It was for us. God spoke through them, and the word of God has been preserved, and it wasn't for them directly. It was for us. And it's the most neglected book in my home. And a lot of people went through a lot of trouble to get the thing written. And in fact, the prophets of old didn't even understand it. But we do. These mysteries that have been kept a mystery for so many years are now revealed to us. We know that Jesus, the Messiah, came, the God-man who died for our sins. And that through having faith in his finished work that we have life in his name. We understand this. And we can look through the Old Testament and see it. His name will be Wonderful Counselor. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. We understand what all that means now. It's Jesus. But the ones who wrote it down had no clue what they were talking about. And it says they searched intently their own writings and said, what does this mean, Lord? He's like, don't worry about it. It's not for you. The scripture says here in 1 Corinthians 10, 8 to 12, we should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did, by the way. He's referring back to the Old Testament, the, the people of God that were called out of Egypt. He was talking about those people that wandered around in the wilderness because they didn't have faith. All of the mistakes and all of the writings about all that mistake was for our benefit. It wasn't just a nice historical document. It's for our benefit to include it in our lives. We should not commit sexual adultery as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ as some of them did. And they were killed by snakes. You guys remember that? Do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. Yeah, that, no thank you. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us. The scripture proclaims that this book is for you. It's not some ancient document out there. This book is for you. And God has preserved it over the years for you. On whom the culmination of the ages has come. All you have to do is watch a little bit of TV and you know that's happening. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Now, why would the scripture say that if I wasn't able to fall? <laughs> It's telling me because there are people in the past who have fallen thinking that they had it all together and they didn't. So I need to be careful, right? Because none of us is far from making a really bad mistake. I mean, we're one mistake away from ruining our lives, right? <laughs> like talking on your phone while you're driving and you're suddenly oncoming traffic. We're all one step away. I think about that when I'm driving and I'm like, ooh. People tearing up the road this way and, you know, you're, you're this far away from them. We're one breath away from dying in a lot of our lives. And I think about that sometimes. So what I want to do is I want to live in such a way that if or when that happens, that I'm not going to be sorry for the stupidity in which I was living in. It says that Angels desire to look into. There are three other observations in the New Testament that says angels are watching. Angels are watching you. Think about that next time you go to the bathroom. <laughs> angels are watching you. I'm not trying to freak you out. Well, maybe I am. That angels are looking into. They desire. You see, angels, if they make a mistake, they're done. They're called fallen angels, and they get thrown out. There's no repentance. There's no forgiveness. There's no grace. There's no mercy. Once and done. And angels look at us and they're like, I don't understand this. Why is God so patient with them? I better check this out. <laughs> angels are curious because they don't have that same relationship. 
and they don't understand grace and they don't understand why Jesus died. I mean, they do now, but they don't know what it's like to be us. And they're curious. I just find that amazing that the scripture says that. So that's what that means. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. By the way, it's not a cut of meat. Gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to formal lusts, as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, be holy, for I am holy. So we're going to be talking about some holiness. I'm going to leave it there because of time, and we'll pick it up next week here in verse 13.